In the first part of this Compound Slide Rebuild series, I talked a little bit about my design thoughts, why I'm redoing everything after only two years and also made the first parts. After starting with the bearing block, the new dial and clamping nut, it's now time to machine the new lead screw spindle, make an adjustable anti-backlash nut and some smaller parts to complete this build. In the opening shot of the first part, I showed you the spindle. This is a 10mm diameter Acme thread spindle with 2mm pitch and, which I just realized after filming, it's a left hand threaded spindle. It was a leftover from the cross slide modification where I needed a left hand thread, but for the compound slide I need a right hand threaded spindle. Luckily I had this spindle flying around which has a right hand thread and luckily the same 2mm pitch, but unfortunately it's only 8mm in diameter. But what sounds like a bug first turned into a feature during the build process. So now let's start making the new spindle. It is actually made out of two parts. One is the standard part Acme thread spindle and the other is the custom machined end for the bearings and handwheel. It's actually the same process I used on the cross light spindle as I prefer standard parts over cutting an Acme thread spindle by myself. I prepared the spindle with a precise diameter and a thread, which will help connect the two parts later. This piece of 15mm steel will make the bearing end for the spindle. It needs a bore and an internal thread too to accept the previously prepared Acme thread spindle. After a short test fit, both parts got cleaned and prepared for a permanently bond with Loctite. The first step is to glue an M3 screw in, which will hold both parts together. The screw must be cut off before the other part can be screwed on. And again a lot of Loctite will hopefully secure the parts forever. Now I can turn this side to a precise bearing fit and turn all the features needed. When turning such a relatively long and precise diameter, it is a good advice to check for any errors in the process. When using the tailstock support, you will most likely turn a slight taper when the tailstock is not perfectly aligned, which you will see on the different numbers. <laughs> 
So by checking this way before you reach the final diameter, you have the chance to adjust the alignment for a perfect cylindrical cut. It's a very tedious process and I had to adjust the tailstock several times before getting an acceptable reading. Still not totally perfect, but at least close. Even with the front end of the spindle being slightly under 10 mm, the bearing just doesn't want to fit at all. So I measured and found out that the inner ring of the bearing is about two hundredths of a millimeter smaller than nominal. To me that's a little bit weird, but I had no other option than adapting the spindle to the measurements of the bearings. So I took a small stone and ground the spindle to the right dimensions. With this done, I turned the second diameter for the hand wheel and cut the M10 by 1mm fine thread, which will hold the spindle in place later. I double checked the pitch with a thread gauge before cutting to final depth. I finally cleaned the thread with a scotch bright like thing. And a short test fit with the locking ring I made in part 1. As I wanted to turn the spindle later, even with the hand wheel detached, I planned an internal hex drive for the spindle end. And as I can't broach internal hex profiles directly, I had to prepare the spindle end for a modified screw which gets glued in. That's the screw I modified off camera, which will be glued in place again with Loctite. I took an M5 screw, turned it down to 4mm and cut an M4 thread on, as I wanted the internal hex drive of an M5 screw, but didn't want to weaken the spindle with an M5 thread. The spindle end got a nice rounding to make it look pleasant and avoid sharp edges. The last step is to cut the spindle to the right length on the bandsaw and clean the saw cut on the lathe. And that's the finished new lead screw spindle. The spindle only got some additional wrench flats afterwards and a small countersink for the set screw of the handle. With the new spindle, now changed to an Acme thread, I need to make a new nut accordingly. Originally, I wasn't planning to make the new nut adjustable to compensate for backlash, as there is almost no space for implementing such a feature. But with the new and now smaller 8mm spindle, I got back a few millimeters, which will be enough for implement an adjustment feature. 
I wanted to save material, so I tried to machine the part directly from the long bar stock. But even with the tailstock support, I got some really bad chattering. So I cut a shorter piece on the bandsaw before further machining the part. This is the main part of the new lead screw nut, which gets an M10 by 0.5mm fine thread on the outside. As I wanted to cut the thread very close to the shoulder, I did the last turns by hand. This is a lot safer than having to stop the motor in the right place. This thread, together with the second part, will make this nut adjustable to minimize the backlash of the spindle. With the outside finished, I now have to prepare the part for the internal Acme thread. For the internal thread, I bought this 8x2mm Acme thread tab. I know, there are people on YouTube making these tabs themselves, but to be honest, for less than 10 euros, which cost me this thing, I wouldn't spend a minute on making this. So I choose the easy way here. This tap produces a lot of chips, so you have to clean it frequently. Before finishing the thread, I flipped the part in the lathe chuck and machined the backside with a relief bore so that the tap can go straight through. After about halfway through, it got really crunchy. Cutting Acme threads, even if it's only an 8mm one, seems to be a really aggressive task. Oh yes, I have a new small silent compressor and now compressed air in the shop. Short test fit with a new spindle. Seems to fit quite good. I cut away most of the material on the backside with a bandsaw and installed a collet chuck to clamp the part on the threads without damaging them. And now to the second part of the nut. It is made out of a smaller bar stock of brass. And yes, speaking of brass, this is not the ideal material for a lead screw nut. You normally would use bronze on these parts, as it has better gliding properties. As I had no bronze on hand, it's a good excuse to make a second video on making a bronze nut in the future. Of course, this part needs the internal Acme thread too. As this part is way shorter than the previous one, the cutting process was a lot easier. Again, pretty crunchy, but it felt way less violent than on the first part. <laughs> 
The backside of this part needs an internal M10 by 0.5 mm fine thread. So I bought these two specific tabs. I bought two because I want to modify one to cut to the very bottom of the part. That means I have to remove the tapered section on the front. So I put the tab in the lathe and installed the little proxon grinder. Very slowly and by trying out different grinding discs, I cut away the tip of the tab. Of course, grinding dust isn't the best for your machine, so I held the vacuum cleaner nearby. And that's the modified tab without a taper on the tip, allowing to cut as close as possible to the bottom of the part. Of course, I started with the normal tab and changed later to the modified one. Now I can finish the thread with a modified tab. Luckily everything went as planned and the modified tab cut as it was suggested. And that's the nut part with the fine thread. It now only needs two wrench flats to make adjustment easier later. A nice tight fit on an 11 mm wrench. To make the anti-backlash nut assembly complete, a small locking nut is needed. It's basically a small steel ring with the same internal M10 by 0.5 mm fine thread. The parting blade leaves a nasty burr, which I had to remove with a scraper before sanding it flat and even. To drive the nut, it gets a small 2mm hole. For wrench flats, the part is too thin walled, but with the hole, it can be driven with one of the small keys which come with every micrometer. And that's the whole anti-backlash nut assembly. I screwed the nut onto a piece of the Acme thread screw for a final finishing cut on the leg. To secure the nut on the spindle, I used the small locking nut. And as the run out in the collet chuck was horrible, 
a change to the forger chuck. Now the front part of the nut needs its mounting holes. As I don't want it to complicately calculate the exact hole positions, I just took the lower part of the compound slide as a drill guide. For this task, this should be accurate enough. A little reminder to myself, you should remove the spindle locking pin before starting the machine. Oops, that was unexpected. This part also needs a flat on the top and a corner filed away on one side. With the filing complete, this part is done. The next part to make is a bushing, which also acts as a nut to preload the bearing assembly. It's made out of a piece of 42 chromoly tool steel. The outer diameter has to be really accurate, because it's the bearing surface for the dial. One part of the bore gets the same M10 by 1 mm fine thread as I cut on the lead screw spindle. Again I shortened the part on the bandsaw before further machining. The inside bore has to be very accurate too for a close fit on the shank of the lead screw spindle. This bushing gets the same drive hole as on the small locking nut from before. And yes, the drill is deflecting quite a bit, but that's not critical here. And that's the finished bushing and lock nut. As I said in the first part, I wanted the handle to be easily detachable. So I drilled all the way through and prepared the handle for a long screw to lock it from the side. I cut an M3 thread and counterboard the handle for the head of the screw. Oops, that was a little bit optimistic. So I reclamped the part properly before starting the machine with its locking pin in place. Again. Okay, but now it should work. I modified an M3 screw for a good fit in the handle. And that's the modified handle and the locking screw. <laughs> 
with the locking screw in the right place, it should sit almost flush with the rounded surface of the handle. This is the last part I made off camera. It's a small spacer ring made out of steel, which will go in between the two bearings and set the right preload. With all the parts complete, I just have to do some finishing touches on the bearing block. First of all, the holes for the mounting screws were still missing. To drill the counter bars, I went over to the drill press. It runs at lower RPM and has more torque than the small milling machine. On a small wobbly machine with a slipping drill chuck, these countersinks tend to chatter quite easy. By applying more pressure on the tool, you can get rid of that. I sanded all the sides for a smooth surface finish. The bearing block also needs a marking to indicate the position of the dial. I took a small engraving bit and engraved a fine line. The last step is to file some nice chamfers to the edges. And that's the finished bearing block. With this all done, it's finally time for showing off all the parts and final assembly. The first step is to press the two angular contact bearings into the bearing block. You have to be careful as the bearings need to be installed in a specific orientation. The side with a wider inner bearing ring needs to be on the outside. I carefully cleaned everything before I pressed in the bearings. At this point I didn't know that this was all for nothing. So I pressed in the first bearing, put the small distance ring in between and pressed in the second bearing. I was really proud of the tight tolerance bearing seats I managed to machine in the bearing block, but in hindsight for this specific arrangement an easy sliding fit instead of a tight press fit would be the better choice. And the reason why comes here. After I had pressed in the two bearings I realized that only one bearing accepted the spindle shaft, the other one was so tight that it just didn't want to fit at all. Here you can see how tight the one bearing was. The tolerances on these bearings seem to be so lousy that you might have one bearing which fits perfectly and another one which doesn't even want to start. Due to the tight bearing seats I couldn't remove the bearings without totally damaging them. And that's the second bearing. By trying to force the bearings out of their bearing seats, I pressed the inner bearing ring out, as angular contact bearings can only take loads in one direction. In the other one, they will fall apart and are ready for the trash bin. As a consequence, I carefully aligned the bearing block on the lathe again and remachined the two bearing seats to a loose sliding fit. With this adjustment it's now possible to change the bearings, just in case, without damaging them. 
In addition to that, I had to buy new bearings. I bought four at once in the hope that at least two will fit. And yes, the first one doesn't. The second one fits perfectly, a loose sliding fit. The third one doesn't want to fit at all. And the fourth one kind of fits. It's tighter than the second one, but at least it's usable. So all in all, it's really a strange story. So finally, the second and hopefully successful try of assembling everything. As the two bearings will be pressed together with a lock nut, the loose sliding fits are okay here. Now the combined bushing and lock nut can be installed. Ideally, the distance ring between the two bearings has the exact width for the right preload of the bearings. Now the dial, the dial lock nut and the handle can be installed. And that's the bearing and dial assembly complete. Now it's time to finally assemble the anti-backlash nut. It's a little bit tricky to find the right position where the nut fits on the spindle. But nothing impossible. Adjusting the nut to the sweet spot between loose and too tight needs a little bit of trial and error. But I managed to get a really good fit. Not too loose and not too tight. And that's the whole assembly, ready to be installed on the compound slide. First, the anti-backlash nut has to be screwed in place with two M3 screws. Now the bearing block with the dial can be screwed in and locked in place with two M4 screws. Now, with everything put together, it's looking pretty neat, I think. Now the whole assembly is ready to be finally reinstalled on the machine. I have to say, the movement is extremely smooth. Even with no noticeable play in the compound slide, I can turn the handle with only one finger. And that's without any drop of oil yet. It's a really satisfying feeling. And the fact that the compound slide is moving by 2 mm per revolution of the handwheel instead of 1 mm like before feels really good.
Also, the dial clamping mechanism seems to work quite well. This is the reason why I wanted the handle to be easily detachable while fully maintaining the function of the compound slide. With a hex key it's possible to drive the compound slide without the handle. Ok, you obviously need the right hex key. In the end I was curious what to expect from the new nut and checked the whole assembly for a backlash. To my surprise there is an almost immediate response on the dial test indicator when turning the handwheel. I can't see any measurable backlash. So all in all I call this rebuild a great success. I hope you enjoyed this video even if it's a little bit on the long side. Consider subscribing to the channel if you like more of this content. Thank you all for watching and till next.